Hello, everyone. You are listening to our future past, the early music podcast. This series is produced by Rema, the European Early Music Network. I am Yasmina Cernčić, and this episode explores the relation between culture, in particular early music, of course, and Europe, historically, but also in its political form today in the European Union. We consider early music as the best example of a cultural community in Europe. Local traditions have spread into more global movements and separated themselves again into regional specificities for over a thousand years, resulting in a huge common heritage. The early music revival movement in itself is also a European moment, with different schools in several places that all focused in their way on this heritage. In this episode, we will question how, today, the European Union consolidates this idea of a common cultural heritage. But first, let's try to go back in time and see how early exactly this early music European community started. My name is Katarina Livjanic and I am a director of the Ensemble Dialogos, specialized in medieval music and in theatrical adaptations and forms of medieval music, a lot of Southern European origins. And I'm also a voice teacher in the Scola Cantorum Basiliensis in the Department of Medieval and Renaissance Music. I started being interested in medieval music quite early, actually, in my life, even as a child, because I grew up in a city in Croatia which had an early music festival. And uh, I had very lucky childhood to be able to discover this kind of very beautiful concerts in a 9th century church. So it certainly influenced my early passion for uh, medieval times and Renaissance music also. But then when I started being a musician actively, my interest was really much more oriented to early Middle Ages and to even music of the Carolingian time and uh, Gregorian chant or also all kinds of liturgical music of Southern Europe. Southern Italy like Benevento, all of these very strange and uh, local musical traditions which were surviving parallelly as Gregorian chant and Carolingian reform was starting to become a dominant software in Europe in the ninth century. I was very interested in these local traditions of the South. Since I come myself from a country which still has an oral tradition of liturgical music, which is called glagolitic chant, then I also, of course, was very interested in the music of my roots. And all that put together then gave birth to projects that we developed later, like uh, Judith or the Tondal's Vision or Dalmatica, all of these programs that we did, which then ended up combining these very local, regional, old traditions and transformed them in staged performances, but then with modern staging. So it's a combination, really, of um, roots and creating something new with these roots. It's very interesting because when we say today mobility of artists, we have two concepts. One is mobility, the other is artist. First, what we consider as an artist today is somebody who is also in this world of very fast communication, a world which also pushes us as artists today very much to constant producing of something new and original. Also, this is the world in which certain concept of celebrity is very important, unfortunately, <laughs> and sometimes even a very kind of temporary disposable celebrity on social media means something to people and it's really something that doesn't stay. And uh, in Middle Ages, an artist is sometimes more like a craftsman, sometimes is more of an anonymous person who is contributing so much by his or her existence and daily practice of music, if we spoke about musicians, it's a person who contributes in transmitting a knowledge that is centuries or millenaries old and, and um, it's a tradition that is transmitted sometimes through entirely anonymous people whose names did not arrive to us. And then we also have the idea of mobility. Today we have this 
this society of, I would say also, of new nomadic people. So there is a mobility of thought which is helped by technology. Wow, it's, it's something that was not possible even some years ago. And so this kind of mobility also, I find it has, of course, it's good and bad sides, but it has this freedom from the walls. And we have that kind of mobility in the Middle Ages. I would compare it very much with those mendicant orders. You have Franciscans or Dominicans, which are, are religious orders which become very popular, let's call it like that, from the 13th century on. These are the people who don't make any vow that they would be stable in one monastery, like the Benedictines were before them. Their mission is to travel, to uh, be very mobile, to be very light, and uh, to be very poor. And they also transmit a huge repertories of music with them. And that makes people of different regions meet and exchange. And so that's very, very interesting kind of mobility that uh, we could also have in mind. And then in the end, what interests me a lot is also the mobility, not only of people in the Middle Ages, but the mobility of stories, of texts, of music. I have been working now for a couple of years on a story that was one of the most mobile stories of the Middle Ages. We re released a CD last year uh, called Barlam and Yosafat. This story is really one of the most mobile stories in the Middle Ages because originally it's a story that tells the life of Buddha. And the first version was in Sanskrit. We have versions from the fourth century. And then this story gets translated from one language to the other, and it travels from country to country. As it travels from country to country, it is obliged to also travel from religion to religion. Because, of course, you arrive in Greece, it's not anymore the same religion. You arrive in uh, Italy or in uh, Russia, or you have to adapt. And so this story, for instance, was for me one of the witnesses of unbelievable mobility in the culture. And the story itself was translated in around 100 languages and went over a certain amount of religions and has lived like that for almost 10 centuries. When you look really back into European history, even look at the Roman Empire, even before Middle Ages, Roman Empire was kind of a proto-European community with all its up and down scales that we can imagine. And then we have again in the 9th century this uh, hugely ambitious European project, which is Charlemagne and Carolingian Empire. Charlemagne really wants to be somehow uh, something of a Roman emperor, but many centuries later. And when he decided to implement a unified circulation of texts, Latin language, even a script that was Carolina, the minuscule that was used, liturgical chant that we commonly know as Gregorian chant. But what he wanted was to really create a common software, like a common operating system <laughs> that allows the circulation of people, of ideas, but also the centralization of power. So there has always been, or at least regularly, a quest for a regional identity in Europe, even very early. So how do you come across this in your work as a performer? And how does it influence your position as a performer, teacher and researcher? When we scratch under the surface of these beautiful big monuments of culture, like Gregorian chant, which is a huge corpus of wonderful music that survived until today. When we scratch under the surface of that, we see how much variety there is inside. And unfortunately, I should say, how many destroyed traditions were there regionally in order to create one big machine, one big software. Thank God that some of these traditions survive in local books, in local regional variants that we can study and discover. And 
every time when something new comes, something old maybe has to disappear. And maybe we have to live with that kind of Pandora's box in history. But that's something that simply happens. I think that in that context of Carolingian unification of musical repertoire, to give that example, there were many encounters of cultures, which were great. But I think that some of these encounters are also great when they motivate each of the encountering cultures to be aware that they are transmitting their own richness. And otherwise, what we can obtain is a kind of tasteless crossover and a colossal, not transmission, but loss of knowledge or richness. The a kind of a phenomenon of what we would call lost in translation. So I think it's very important to be aware of varieties when many different cultures encounter. Thank you, Katarina Livlenic, for this portrayal of Europe as a very ancient community where cultural unity supports the political identity. As early music performers, not only specialized in medieval music, we look for the source of the music, but it is an endless quest that actually reveals how deep it is rooted in our culture with inspiration coming from far away a long time ago. That is where early music comes from. But how does it look today? What is the impact of European policies on the culture, and more specifically the early music sector? Within the Schengen area, artists are free to travel and work, which is of course one of the main elements that make it possible for you to enjoy high-quality concerts performed by foreign artists. But in addition to that, how does the European Union support the mobility of artists and enable you to listen to the best artists of the most remote corners of the European Union in the city you live in? European policies and programs may not look easy to grasp, so here they are for you, put in a nutshell by our next guest. So hello, my name is Simone Dutt. I'm one of the two secretary generals of the European Music Council. We are doing this in dual leadership together with my colleague Ruth Jacobi. Um, the European Music Council is a network of European music organizations. Uh, we bring together a diverse range of um, music organizations such as national music councils that are active on a national level, European music organizations, so we are happy that REMA is one of our members, but also the European Choral Association is a member, the International Association of Schools of Jazz, the Europe Jazz Network. So on a European level, we have networks that gather or that deal with a specific aspect of the music sector and we also have international organizations uh, such as the international association of music information centers or many others and we are the regional group for europe of the international music council that was founded upon request of unesco already in 1949 So one of the activities of the European Music Council is also to work uh, on cultural policy on a European level. Naturally, culture is actually a competence of the member states of the European Union. So when the European Union is working on cultural policies, they only do that in uh, addition to what is actually being done on a national level. So, for example, also in Germany, it's even more triggered down because in Germany, um, cultural is also the competence of the lender and the regions. So this has its mirror also at the European Union level. However, culture is very important for Europe and the European Union, and it's also written in the European Union treaties. Culture is also written down in the Treaty of Lisbon for the European Union and it's Article 167. For the Treaty of Maastricht, it was 151, Article 151. So we have that already in the treaties of the European Union, which is very important. But we also have the European Agenda for Culture. And there, now it's a new European agenda for culture, which actually also defines what the European Union can do with respect, with regards to culture. Mm -hmm. 
having um, culture included in uh, Article 167 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union is very important, but at the same time, there's also, since 2007, a Commission communication that is a European agenda for culture in a globalized world, which for the first time wrote down policies in the field of culture for the EU. And in 2018, this document was updated and it has strategic objectives and actions. So one of the strategic objectives is to um, have a look at the social dimension, harnessing the power of cultural and cultural diversity for social cohesion and well-being. Another objective is the economic dimension, supporting culture-based creativity in education and innovation and for jobs and growth. And an external dimension, strengthening the international cultural relations. So these are the three core objectives of the new European Agenda for Culture. As goes with all policy documents, they now also will have to find their relation or their equivalence in funding programs. So the European Union also has a number of programs that fund cultural activities. So the first and foremost program, of course, is the Creative Europe program that has different strands as well, that has strands for cooperation projects. It also has a strand um, for European networks. And as a part of the Creative Europe program, there's also the audiovisual program. But so this is the core program for cultural cooperation, cultural exchange and mobility. There are also other funding programs, such as the Horizon program, the Erasmus Plus program, that also offer specific calls for culture embedded in their program activities that you can be uh, supported also with a cultural dimension. For example, Erasmus Plus has a lot of also training, um, professionalization um, programs where you can um, have a cultural angle to it. Also with the Horizon 2020, of course, it is more or less not possible to do this without a scientific research institution or a university because this is the research program of the European Union. Then the European Union also has the structural funds. These are the funds to promote or to strengthen structurally weak regions within the European Union. So, for example, a festival or a cultural activity in a region can very much contribute to strengthening a region. And in such a line of thinking could also be funded within the structural funds. However, they are mostly also administered by the regions or the countries. So they are not directly administered by the European Union directly itself. Then you have also some funding schemes from the COSME program, which is small and medium-sized enterprises. So there, there are a lot of European Union funding programs aside the cultural funding within Creative Europe. However, you always have to bear in mind, looking at these programs, that they have another background, that their main goal might be regional development, research, university exchange, mobility of professionals such as with Erasmus+. Plus. So the line of thinking would be different. The European Union has also introduced the open method of coordination within the culture sector. The member states discuss specific topics and they are actually also defined by the Culture Council. So they set up a work plan and they define what topics they will discuss for the next years. And similar to that, the European Commission has also committed to exchange with the sector, so with the culture sector directly and itself through the Voices of Culture 
debates and dialogues, and there they also focus on specific topics. For example, last year there was a topic on gender equality uh, in the culture sector, and we also have a topic on urban development and culture. And these topics, there, there they bring together experts directly from the cultural sector. And the European Commission also really tries to bring both groups together. So the people from the cultural sector directly together with the OMC working groups. And for example, the European Music Council has also been involved in the gender equality discussion. And there the exchange with the OMC groups was, was really very fruitful. And um, I think it's how a, a structured dialogue between the sector and the member states and the European Union could uh, work. So I really thought that was this was quite exemplary and is a good way forward to exchanging or engaging all parts of the culture sector, the policymakers and the field and the people from the field. And one, of course, important uh, flagship programs of the European Union um, for uh, culture is also, of course, the European Capitals of Culture. So that is, this is also for them to promote European culture in a city directly on place. In 2018, they had a thematic year. The European Year of Cultural Heritage took place at that. And there is still an ongoing legacy. Now there's an expert forum on cultural heritage that continues the debate with the people, the Cultural Heritage Forum, that continues the debate with those involved in the European Year of Cultural Heritage with the European Commission and the policymakers on heritage issues. So, of course, when talking about the funding programs, we're talking about the current funding scheme, which runs until 2020. And in 2021, the new financial framework for the European Union would start. At this point of time, there is no decision on the exact budget that it will have. So what, how much money a Creative Euro program would receive or how much money Erasmus+, Plus, Horizon, etc. So we don't know what the future will bring. But of course, we hope that funding for culture will also continue in the future in 2021 onwards. Thank you, Simone Dutt, for this presentation that gives us an overview of what Europe does for culture at all levels. The common values that represent all of us, European citizens, are expressed in policy documents and then are implemented through various programs that may be dedicated specifically to culture for the more visible or in a less conspicuous way to other transversal sectors such as education and research. Also, structural funds are redistributed locally to develop certain territories. Simone Dutt described the situation as of end of May 2020 and I can add this last minute update. Since we interviewed her, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, presented the budget for the coming years on May 27th. This now has to be negotiated between the Commission, the Parliament and the Member States. As the funding programs that were mentioned apply to culture in general, and not specifically to early music, I may add that REMA, for example, is funded by the Creative Europe program, among other networks. Another example from the early music sector is the European Union Baroque Orchestra, which was founded by various EU cultural programs from 1985 until 2018. Emerging Plus is another project that supports young early music ensembles through residencies and trainings that is funded by Creative Europe. This brings us to my last guest today, Dilma Tomlin from the National Center for Early Music in York, which is a member of Emerging Plus, to discuss how her organization deals with the current situation with Brexit in sight. What happens to an institution with a truly European mission when it has to leave the scope of Europe? My name is Delma Tomlin. I'm director of the National Centre for Early Music in York. I'm also a board member of REMA and have been for some years, I'm delighted to say. And I'm a partner within the large-scale uh, cooperation project of Emerging. 
So traditionally, of course, English musicians have travelled across continental Europe and have exchanged ideas, whether through the court system or travelling in much earlier days. The British have always travelled to Europe. It is perhaps a little bit more complicated at the moment with the issues around Brexit because the UK government funds the, the arts in a very different way. It has an arts council in England, another one in Wales, Northern Ireland and a similar institution in Scotland. And that's been running since the 1950s but early music doesn't really figure very high in their, their thinking. As the National Centre for Early Music, we have statutory funding from the Arts Council in England. And we have a little tiny bit of money from the local authority. But we don't have, as you have in Europe, if you like, the much greater funding possibilities from the departments and certainly from France, of course, the Ministry of Culture. Maybe that has made British-based musicians much more able to stand on their feet much earlier because they've had to do a lot of what we were talking about in other podcasts of having to be very entrepreneurial, of having to work across a whole series of different ensembles or ready to fund their own recording opportunities and to, to act as business people. They, they don't have the luxury of being funded. So that's, that's changed things. But the current situation, as we run into Brexit, as we understand where Brexit is going at the moment, obviously is making things even more difficult because we are now talking about the, the complications of travel from the UK uh, into Europe and whether we will need um, carnets, what that means is at the moment very unclear for everybody. It's clearly, just at the precise moment, a little bit daunting and I certainly have had conversations with ensembles who are quite anxious to come here this financial year, this, this academic year because they don't want to get mixed up in whatever happens next year. Again, because none of us quite know what that's about. But it will sort itself out. It's just a case of how long and where the financial resource comes from that and what the, the issues are for promoters on both sides of the channel, really. Clearly, it's going to be a great deal easier for people based in Europe to engage European ensembles and European artists until such time as all this is sorted out. So that's where we are just now. The York Early Music Festival has been fortunate to have funding from the uh, Creative Europe programme for quite some time as a festival. And that gave us a chance to understand the European funding structures, which are, are so very different from the Arts Council and from the UK structures. And it gave us the confidence, certainly, to think that we were more than capable, uh, structurally, with ourselves, to work with emerging. So when we had conversations 2013-ish about whether to join as a, as a main partner with this large-scale cooperation project, uh, we felt very confident that we, we, we could understand it and work it out. And we have been part of merging that first uh, schedule from 2014 to 18, and we're part of certainly part of the main partnership uh, still until 2022 or 2023, depending on how quite how long these, these things go on at this particular time. And there's no change in that at the moment. We retain because all those things were signed off well before uh, the Brexit issue. After that, it would be more complicated. Would the UK go down to being a third country? It, it is going down in terms of the financial involvement that you can have in these programmes. Uh, yes. Would we still wish to be involved? Yes, of course. 
from the NCM's perspective, we are a European uh, festival, an organisation, all the things that we deal with are European. Are we probably the only ones who are regularly getting European funding, certainly in early music terms? Yes. And that's partly because we have an organisation that can deal with the complicated structures of how it is that you report back to Creative Europe. You need a certain confidence to be able to do that. We are very involved with the Creative Europe desk in London, but the gentleman who has been running that for some years has now gone off to work within the British Council. And again, it's part of what is happening at the moment. There is an absolute dearth of positive information whilst this UK government deals with the issues going on around COVID, really. And Brexit seems to have disappeared over the horizon somewhere. This will not in any way, in the longer term, stop the exchange of music making from the UK and uh, to continental Europe. But it may be a bit of a complicated bump. And from the National Centre's perspective, we see ourselves certainly as one of the, well, the only organisation really, that potentially can help ensembles and artists to navigate that complicated arena because we have very close relationships, obviously, with Rema and also with colleagues in Antwerp and with Emerging. So we are perhaps better placed to understand the European structure and certainly, obviously, understand the UK one and then to try and work out how it is that we get through something which is just deeply complicated. Thank you, Dilma Tomlin. And so this episode ends on a slightly dramatic note, maybe, that mirrors the uncertainty in which many cultural institutions are today because of Brexit or coronavirus issues that challenge our trust in an open Europe where men travel freely to share the ideas of music. This podcast series is a preparation for the upcoming European Early Music Summit that will take place in Bozar in November 2020 in partnership with the AEC. It will assess the state of early music today and take a critical look at its practices and evolution. The next episodes will give you an overview of the topics that will be debated during this three-day conference. So stay tuned for more insight into the lives and ideas of your favorite performers, to know what your favorite concert halls are up to these days, and get to know in advance what you can expect for the next years of live or recorded music and exciting research projects. See you next week for more episodes. <laughs>